as we have seen, there are six technical sessions. We are starting with the first session, that is origin, yoga in ancient Indian text, contribution of Chanakya. Yogena chittasya palena vacha malam sharirasya chavaidya kena yopakarotam pravaram muninam patanyalim pranjalirana tosmi. All the learned scholars, President of ICCR, Dr. Vinayji. It is really a very memorable, eventful day as we are presenting something about yoga here in the consulate. Much has been said about yoga in the inaugural session and therefore my work is a uh, little easier because I'll be giving a comparative picture of yoga, the connect between yoga and Artha Shastra. So yoga and Artha Shastra, my first slide, it says that something about yoga its various types. Dr. Nagendra Ji has already given some glimpses about the plurality of yoga. So I won't say anything as we are running short of time. Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is the very systematic approach towards yoga, which can be really academically pursued in the universities. And now that the attempts also are made to include plural yogas in a systematic manner. But about yoga of Patanjali, there are eight steps. And the goal of yoga, as it has been very nicely put in the inaugural lecture, the goal of yoga is uh, the mental modifications which are disturbing to control the mental modifications or rather restrain of the mental modifications with awareness. And then the second sutra which speaks about is that Tadadrashtu Swarupe Avasthanam, the third sutra. Tadadrashtu Swarupe Avasthanam, that is experiencing the real nature of a human individual. Every human person is born with infinite abilities, capacities, consciousness and to uncover that and to experience that infinitude is the goal of yoga. I will not explain this much. Let me now come to the connect itself before we go to the second slide of this. And the second slide speaks about the eight steps of yoga. The learned audience and the learned panelists know about it, so I really don't have to. But the circle, which indicates that I will be focusing on three steps, Pratyahara, Dharana, and Dhyana. That is because Artha Shastra, which is a treatise written by Chanakya, which is about good governance, which is also about how to train a good leader. And therefore, what is important is the treatise begins with Vidya Samuddesha, that is the entire cluster of knowledge. And within Vidya Samuddesha, there are four parts of the syllabi which is designed for a would-be leader or a king which has to undergo the training. And that within Vidya Samuddesha, there are the first topic which is Anvikshiki. That is, it is about the knowledge, it is about methodology, methodology and the types of thinking, patterns. And then it is Trai, Varta, Dandaniti. All these are in the Vidya Samuddesha. In the Anvikshiki part of it, there are three philosophical schools which are mentioned. The first philosophical school is that of Lokayata. Second is Sankhya and third is Yoga. Here comes the basic reference to philosophy of Yoga. Well, 
Lectures can be arranged on Anvikshiki itself. I will not go into the detail. The question which comes to my mind is that even though Sankhya and Yoga are used as many times Samana Tantra, why is it that a separate mention of Sankhya and Yoga is done in Kautilya Artha Shastra? It may be because Sankhya is more rationalist in its approach, because Anumana Eva Pradhana Sankhya, and yoga is more into creative knowledge. It's more into Ritambhara Tasya Pradnyaha as the sutra mentions. But I will not again explore that. What I will say is that a small line occurs in a commentary where Arthashastra mentions about yoga. These three steps of yoga are mentioned as the course curriculum, namely Pratyahara, then it is dharana and then dhyana. That is the earlier, sorry, the next slide where I have put the circle. And therefore, in my paper, I will more focus on pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and how these are really connected with the course curriculum. And the goal of creating a good leader is uh, partially achieved by uh, this particular training program. Pratyahara actually is the fifth step in the eight uh, steps of yoga. It connects the external aspect of yoga, which is called the Bahiranga Yoga, and the internal aspect of yoga, that is the Antaranga Yoga. So I think the brevity in the commentary, where Pratyahara is mentioned, actually all earlier steps are covered. Because without undergoing the training of yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, it is very difficult to come to the stage of pratyahara. So what is pratyahara? It's the next slide. And it is withdrawal of the senses from the sense objects. Now what does it mean? A leader is advised to have this particular practice of withdrawal of senses from the sense objects and focusing from the outward journey to the inward journey, as it is a connecting link between Antaranga and Bahiranga Yoga, when I look at it, I feel that the mind is really restless when one starts practicing it. And what is required for a good leader is that mind should be calm, quiet, and it is a preparation of dhyana, that is the concentration, that a leader really has to develop and therefore, uh, what is advocated is that pratyahara. And prior to pratyahara is uh, pranayama, that is the practice of breathing. It is after pratyahara. What is very important is dharana, that is the concentration on a particular object. It may be a gross object, or it may be from gross to very subtle object. The concentration of it is very important that the chitta bhumi from, uh, chitta bhumi from the trasa or the chitta bhumi from the restlessness to uh, go to ekagra or to the concentrated point. What is suggested is if we study Yoga Sutra systematically, the methods of eliminating the restlessness of the mind are also suggested. I'll just mention not the explanation of it. They are abhyasa. That is mentioned uh, in the earlier sutras. There is vairagya in the sutra 1.2. There is also Ishwara pranidhana 1.23. There is also omkara tajjapata dartha bhavanam that is 1.32. And there is also Chitta Prasadana. All these are used. Now, plurality indicates that the choice is given to the individual. That individual may select anyone as per one's own capability, capacity, uh, likes and dislikes. Now, with this, one really passes on to. So, concentration is there. Then comes Dhyana. That Pratyahara Dharana is helpful to control six enemies. And in the Sutra, Arishadvarga Tyagena, he says that there are six enemies like Kama, Krodha, Madha, Moha, Matsara, Lobha, etc. 
which are really distracting for anybody who wants to play the role of a leader. And by developing pratyahara dharana, and a leader with the concentrated mind can attain to multiple tasks and also is very efficiently able to take the decisions. So the next slide, and that is the next slide is the ideal leader. The word which Chanakya uses is really very significant word. He uses the word Raja Rishi. At the same time, he's a king, and at the same time, he's also sage, a tranquil sage. Now, see that how two contradictory, apparently contradictory things are coming together. Now, what is very important is that the daily routine of a king, and this will be my last point, the daily routine of a king indicates that a king can sleep for three and a half hours during the night, and maybe one hour during, or uh, sorry, half an hour during the daytime to have a power nap. And simultaneously, he has to attain to so many tasks. He has to get the knowledge about his kingdom, and his eyes are spies, charena chakshu. And vidya vinita raja, it means that he is really learned, and not only knowledgeable, but he is also wise. He is all with the power and the wealth, and still, in a very detached way, he uses it for the people. Praja Sukhe Sukham Raja. Thank you very much. In a practical sense, it would seem that the Pratyahara stage, in terms of regular meditation, could just be saying, withdrawing the senses is just sitting comfortably and closing the eyes, because automatically you withdraw from the world. Much individual freedom is given. Uh, how to concentrate? Yatha abhimata dhyanatva. Yatha abhimata dhyanatva. It means that uh, after a little training into it, freedom is given to the individual if the individual is advanced enough to decide that what is appropriate for oneself, and uh, individual can select that particular object of concentration. Sitting whether with the closed eyes or with the open eyes also may depend on the individual. If the individual is able to concentrate, sitting in the midst of hustle and bustle, of course not initially. Initially maybe one has to uh, acquire that. But this is a beautiful part of the commentary that it gives individual a freedom. And when we look at within the context that a leader is using this, Maybe a trained leader simultaneously paying attention to uh, so many things. There is a word in Sanskrit which is called Ashta Avadhana. It means that simultaneously eight different places the concentration of a king is there. Now it's a difficult thing for a common man to appreciate. Uh, we find it difficult even to concentrate in one particular point. You know, we are listening to a lecture and our mind Fickle way uh, goes round on hundred places. As a leader, uh, some people express that they are very much scared, afraid inside them to uh, speak and to uh, relate to people in in a larger uh, content or larger context. How do you explain this in yoga terms? Uh, see, yoga always uh, speaks about overcoming the uh, limitations of a personality. There are nine such obstacles in the practice of yoga. And uh, you can say it is the practice of the <laughs> earlier part of you yoga, which is called the Bahiranga Yoga. Turn it off. And then this coming to the Antaranga Yoga, quiet. especially Pranayama. And then, because Pratyahara is later, yeah, but Pranayama no. and the earlier practice may help to overcome, because all the obstacles in the practice of yoga are overcome by this. So fear of communicating also can be overcome this way. Dr. Gangadhar Nair, who is a moderator of the session, actually taught me the 6,000 sutras of Arthashastra. I'll come to that particular point. So I went to Kerala, where uh, he's a Sanskrit scholar himself from the Adi Shankaracharya Sanskrit University. One teacher, one student, where 6,000 sutras were learned. And I have Dr. Shubhada Joshi, ma'am, who just uh, gave the first uh, opening session. I did my PhD under her. So it's actually, for a student, a privilege <laughs> to
to speak on uh, the subject which I learned from both of them. So I feel uh, it's an honor. Coming to the topic, uh, my topic, uh, as you know, the theme is about uh, uh, Chanakya. My paper, which of course will be a full paper later on, there's a small abstract in the uh, booklet. It's on Anvikshiki, Chanakya's philosophy and yoga. Madam mentioned about Anvikshiki. Uh, it's a deep subject I like to touch upon from the yogi, yoga perspective. Many of you may or may not be knowing about Chanakya, but uh, looking at the paper, Chanakya, also known as Vishnugupta and Kautilya, the well-known teacher, thinker, philosopher, kingmaker, strategist, and policymaker, lived in India in the 4th century BC. Roughly 2,400 years ago, there lived such a man. He is well known to have planned the defeat of Dhananand, the last king of the Nanda dynasty, and also Alexander when he was on his way to conquer the world, and establishing his able student, Chandragupta Maurya, on the throne of Magadh kingdom, which is now in modern Bihar, India. And finally, making Chandragupta Maurya the emperor of united India. Later, he wrote the Kautilya's Arthashastra as a manual and guide to his students on the strategies and policies to rule and manage a vast kingdom. We can also call Arthashastra of Kautilya as one of the oldest document available to mankind about the concepts of good governance and training and making of a good leader. It is well written like a constitution of a nation which is the guiding beacon for any country. The Arthashastra has 6,000 sutras or verses divided into 15 books, 150 chapters and 180 topics including selection and training of a leader, selection of ministers, establishment of towns and villages, revenue collections, administration, military warfare, foreign policy, law, among other topics. However, Chanakya has dealt in detail about the values and foundations that go on to make a great leader and a good kingdom. We at the University of Mumbai, under the leadership of Dr. Shubda Joshi Madam, have an institution called the Chanakya International Institute of Leadership Studies, which offers a two years postgraduate degree course on leadership science based on Chanakya's Arthashastra. So you know, it's not just a paper, but we are, we are fortunate to actually teach it in the academic uh, curriculum. Now, after the introduction, I'll come to the topic. The first chapter of Arthashastra, named Anvikshiki Sthapana, establishment of philosophy for a leader. A leader's first training is that his base should be philosophy. Gives a direction to the king in making. Let me use this word, the king in making. It is easier to train a raw person than training a person who's already sitting on the throne. So king in making about importance of philosophy, thus creating the philosopher king who will be an ideal leader. This thought of philosopher king, we also see in the teachings of Socrates. Those who are exposed to the Western uh, philosophy know uh, this thought coming from Socrates. And Arthashastra opens, the first sutra of Arthashastra, which comes in book number one, chapter two, sutra number one says, Anvikshiki trai varta dandaniti cheti vidya. Anvikshiki, which is philosophy, Three, which are the three Vedas, Varta, which is economics, and Dandaniti, which is science of politics. These are the four essential knowledges required for a leader. So if you are training somebody, these are the minimum four essential knowledges. He calls it Vidya. And coming to Anvikshiki, he says, Anvikshiki, which is philosophy, is a combination of Sankhya, Yoga, and Lokayata. R.P. Kangli, one of the eminent scholars of Sanskrit from the University of Mumbai in 1963 has translated the Arthashastra of Sanskrit book into English. It is a very widely acclaimed uh, contribution. Uh, if anybody is interested in knowing that, uh, it's very easily available. Kangle translates Anvikshiki as philosophy. If you read different versions, you find different definitions, but Kangle's version says it's philosophy and a method of right and critical thinking which is the combination of Sankhya, one of the six well-known darshanas in the Indian tradition, Yoga, at the mental and intellectual level, and Lokayata, which is material and worldly wisdom. So what is Anvikshi? Combination of the three. 
Now coming specifically to yoga. In the context of Anvikshiki, it is to keep the mind steady and equanimous in all circumstances and conditions. He calls it Pradipaha Sarva Vidyanam. It is a guiding lamp of all senses. The state of mind and the ability to take right decisions at the intellectual mental level is a part of yoga. With a well-balanced mind, thoughts and emotions under control, the leader can not only rule and administer the kingdom effectively, but also he can guide others towards a noble and value-based society. Here I like to reflect upon various thoughts in the other Indian scriptures where it says Raja Kalasya Karanam in the Mahabharat or Yatha Raja Tatha Praja. So we naturally try to copy what the leader does. So if a leader is a philosophical leader, so society also becomes like this. And this is done through the state of a yogic mind of a leader. So my th uh, thought was that what is yoga? It is at various levels we have seen, even Naganaji putting it, but we are talking about this mental state which is in equanimous position, the yogic mind. The state of the yogic mind included in Anvikshiki is achieved by the leader through various methods, but I like to point out three given in the Artha Shastra. How do you achieve the state of a yogic mind? The first one is called Vridha Sanyogaha. Association with elders and being mentored by various experts of different fields. A leader cannot start from zero. So, Vridha is senior people. He should be associated and mentored by seniors. So, Sanyogaha, be in touch with experts. Second is Swadhyaya. So, Madam mentioned about the daily routine of a king is only supposed to sleep for three and a half hours and then maybe maximum four hours. So, if you see that you know, the leader is working very hard and he doesn't sleep, it is good. <laughs> so, don't get pity over him, you know, Sotani. It is very important. But on a daily routine of a king, one and a half hours per day he has to study. Swadhyaya. The daily study of scriptures which guides the leader during Dharma Sankat, also called as moral and ethical dilemmas. Most of the leaders face that problem, you know, what to do and what not to do. That's the question. And finally, the third one is Mantra Shakti. How does the leader actually get this state of mind? By Mantra Shakti. The power of a king achieved through the counsel and discussions with his wise ministers. So when you're in a difficult situation, you have the Vridha Sanyoga, the gurus who will tell you, but also your colleagues who will actually guide you. Yes. And finally, leading to the ultimate aim of the philosophy of leadership. Praja Sukhe Sukham Ragnya Prajanam Chahite Hitam. In the happiness of the people lies the happiness of the king and what is beneficial to the people is his own benefit. Which comes in the Artha Shastra, book number 1, chapter 19, surah number 34. With this I would like to invite you, because each one of you are a leader in your own field. You are at the head of a department or a university or maybe some business community. Artha Shastra's state of mind, the yogic mind, definitely will help us achieve good leadership. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, leaders are to be made, not to be born. Yeah. Uh, right now, the situation has been changed. Yeah. That was a kingdom, king, and now it is a democrat. So in this scenario, where the people has to select a leader, yeah. where it could be good or bad also, yes. but we, we have seen the history, I don't want to go in detail, but to do the, is there any way or something has been written for the de democratic point of view, how the democratic society is coming up, because the, the organizations are all leadership based. Yeah. But the uh, society of the politics is not. Yeah. What is your opinion on that? Sure. Thank you so much. In fact, this is one topic that we've been discussing a lot because our field is leadership science. So the question that everybody asks, are leaders born or are leaders made? And especially coming to the democratic situation, the first thing that we say is that born leaders should be trained and also given opportunities. So if there is a leadership talent, that is not enough. You need to train the person. But a trained leader should also be made a leader. You have to give them opportunities. Now, I will not go into the detail, but the selection of a leader is a very interesting dimension from the Indian perspective. Because Chanakya uses a lot of science and methodologies to select. If you look at Chandragupta Maurya, he was not born in a I mean, the leadership family. He was not from a Rajukula. Some studies say he was a Dasi Putra. But why deny a great born leader a leadership position? So he trains him up and of course gives him opportunity. I'm not going to details, but I'm saying one of the sciences in India is actually astrology. You know, the problem is that we look at astrology and astrologer from unscientific way. 
Astrology is a science and astrologer is a scientist. In the Artha Shastra, Chanakya talks about the Vidya of Jyotish. I mean, I don't know in detail, but you know, if there is a selection, then you train them up. Coming back to your final question of democracy, we are talking about democracy as a form of governance today. So, you know, we are talking everybody is moving into democracy, but Chanakya talks about the attitude of democracy, even if you are from the leadership family. So, in the olden days, we did not have leadership from the democratic standpoint. But look at the example of Chanakya. He bought in a person who was actually having a democratic attitude. And what Shubda ma'am and me also like, finally, what is the attitude? Praja sukhe, it is not my sukha. And as Bhishma says in Mahabharat, desh raja ke liye nahi hota, raja desh ke liye hota hai. <laughs> the kingdom is not for the king to enjoy, but it is for the king to serve. So I think that's the attitude he trains with. Thank you. I have one question for you. Yeah. Yes. Guru. Yeah. Uh, firstly, of course, to answer his question, that's where uh, Dr. Vinay Sahasabuddha and I come in. We have Rambao Malgi Prabodhini, yes. where you can send all the elected representatives for training to become better leader, leaders. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned Raja Kalasya Karaka. Yes. Can you expound on that and where is it from, please? Absolutely. Sir, I'm so happy because we have some Sanskrit scholars here who actually will uh, talk about that in detail. We have Madhvi Ma'am and of course. So this is one of the very great uh, Indian treasure that we have in leadership, which is Bhishma's advice to Yudhishthira towards the end of Mahabharata. And there is a very beautiful question, it's a philosophical question that, you know, it's been asked to Bhishma, does a king create an era or does an era create a king? Sahi samay pe acha raja aata hai ya acha ra ek acha raja sahi samay banata hai? Who is dependent? Is the leader who comes and creates everything good or a good situation brings in a leader? And Bhishma says, without doubt, you know, there is no doubt about it that the right leader will create the whole era that is required. So, Chanakya clearly says, looking at the whole system, just get the right person on the top, he will change everything. So, the leadership is very important. So, selection of leader and creating. So, coming back, the Mahabharata discussion is a very profound discussion. We can, of course, have it off the state. But, not a single doubt, Raja Kalasya Karanam. What I would like to do in the very short time uh, allotted to me is to try to give a brief con conceptual overview of what the Yoga Sutras have to say about yoga. As, as people have mentioned, obviously yoga is well known as a set of uh, familiar exercises, but, but the, in the Yoga Sutras, the first of which has been mentioned, Atha Yoga Anushasanam, it's, a, it's an Anushasanam, it's an instruction, it's a systematic presentation of what was known previously from ancient times in various texts. A comprehensive system of purifying the consciousness in order to attain clear experience of oneself and nature. This is what yoga is. So in its early history, some of you have already spoken about in Chanakya and uh, uh, some verses were cited from the Bhagavad Gita also, uh, but it goes back in the Indian tradition to Vedic texts where we have in the Rig Veda, Nivartatvam, return, go back, calling back metaphorically the senses in, in, in a mantra which says, Yadniyanam, Nyayanam, Sanyanam, Yadparayanam, the highest, the supreme entity, consciousness, Sanyanam, is Nyayanam, the drawing back of the, in this verse, metaphorically, cows, but they're meaning the senses here, because obviously cows don't have anything to do with Sanyanam or consciousness. So these these mantras which we have from ancient times and verses in the Upanishads and so forth uh, give some knowledge of, of yoga, but it's the yoga sutras which give a systematic presentation. So we've seen that in non-systematic elsewhere, but a systematic presentation in the yoga sutras. The author of the uh, grammatical treatise, the Mahabhashya, is Patanjali, and it's this Patanjali who is attributed with authorship of the yoga sutras about 150 BC. So uh, now the, uh, they probably attained their form a, a bit later in the, in the third and fifth, between the third and fifth centuries, and Vyasa commented on it about 100 years later. But this systematic presentation now is what we want to focus on. 
it primarily adopts the systematic understanding of nature present in the Sankhya system. That is the ontology of Prakriti and Purusha with Prakriti or nature completely separate from a number of different Purushas, individual uh, persons. It consists of 195 sutras with four chapters which have been mentioned already. Now, what is the purpose of yoga? Well, we understand that all of the experience which we undergo is transitory and due to that transitory nature of experience we, and the inability to cope with change, one experiences suffering. And this is, this is the general outlook uh, which is mentioned in one verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Matra sparsha stukanteya shitoshna sukha dukada agama payano nitya sthansthitiksha svabharata. Uh, this is also what's mentioned here in this Yoga Sutra. Parinama tapasanskara dukat. Okay, because of the uh, suffering due to the changes inherent in the fundamental properties of nature, its uh, suffering is inevitable uh, in, in the relative world. So how do we deal with this as an ultimate solution to this? Uh, it's avoidable, okay, heyam dukkamanagatam. Suffering is caused by the conjunction between the silent witnessing self, that is the purusha, and the object of experience, nature. In, what do we mean by conjunction? The conjunction is when the individual self identifies itself with things which are not the self. The individual self, which is pure consciousness, thinks that what it is, is the intellect, the mind, the senses, and the body, mistakenly. And because of that mistaken identification, it suffers from changes which are beyond its control. So uh, the suffering is avoidable, caused by the conjunction. The conjunction consists in this relation of master and property, the swami, swaswami shaktyoho surup urabdihetu sanyogaha. And how is it caused? The cause of it is ignorance, incorrect knowledge. How do we remove it? In the absence of ignorance, the conjunction is destroyed and the self becomes isolated in kaivalya, which is a state of self-sufficiency. Now, the direct means to the destruction of ignorance is unwavering knowledge of the distinction between the self and nature. That is viveka kyati. How do we get there? By the practice of the eight limbs of yoga, yoga anganushtana. The eight limbs have been summarized previously, so we don't need to go into those again. Uh, the self, the self re-sees, it, it often is translated as reflects, but it's actually not reflecting. The self re-sees what is presented to the intellect, all the cognitions which occur in consciousness. And uh, it, it usually in our behavior imitates those uh, fluctuations of consciousness and uh, And those fluctuations of consciousness are distorted by various afflictions that a person undergoes. That is, stress and strain, uh, tensions and so forth, uh, incorrect knowledge. How do we, how do we uh, uh, identify this, this ignorance, which is the fundamental in, in affliction, promotes the other four, which are these uh, avidya asmita, which is egoity, uh, uh, avidya asmita, raga, that is passion or uh, attachment, dvesha, uh, aversion, and abhinivesha, that is uh, uh, attachment to life. So ignorance is the source of these. It's due to the erroneous identification of the self with aspects of nature, that is particularly with the intellect. And uh, 
and this is a, this is our uh, attachment. Yeah, I've already mentioned them. Aversion and desire to continue to exist. Now, uh, the impressions that we have from past experience predispose one to act in certain ways. Somebody rings a bell behind a child from uh, from uh, childhood. It conditions that child to respond in a certain way to to this bell ringing. This is the kind of research that was done by uh, behaviorists. We're, we're also conditioned by our past experience and we tend to interpret the experiences we are exposed to in terms of past experiences, in terms of generalities and so forth. But that prevents us from reacting to the experiences which we are undergoing in, a, in an appropriate way. And so, how do we get out of this, uh, this trap we're in of having our past experience guide our current responses to situations? Well, we, this is influenced by the dispositions which are deposited in our personality and we have to release these, that is release these stresses and, uh, uh, and uh, get rid of these uh, in impressions. So, the impressions of past results, I will skip over this, give, give rise to future uh, uh, bondage in, in the, uh, and, and uh, being trapped in those previous uh, behaviors. So, to get rid of that, the yogic practices have the twofold effect of weakening these afflicting uh, stresses and promoting the settling of consciousness. Meditation weakens the active afflictions and the fluctuations of consciousness are quieted through practice and dispassion which has been mentioned, abhyasa and vairagya. Practicing long, uninterrupted and respectfully makes settling, settled consciousness firm. Practice in experiencing the cognition of cessation, that is virama pratyaya, leads to the establishment of pure consciousness or what is called asampragnata samadhi. And uh, that leads to settled awareness, which leads to correct knowledge or prajna. And uh, we can meditate on anything, as someone said, yatha abhimata dhyana dva, on a, a desired object. The, the, the essential principle is ekatattva abhyasa, that is, bringing the attention to rest on a single object, because the mind is scattered in various directions. If we bring the mind to settle on a, on a single object, we're collecting the attention from its scattered state into a more settled and focused state. Uh, these are obstacles uh, to, to uh, meditation and uh, other agitations which prevent our meditation. But focusing on a single object counteracts these obstacles. And uh, it's, this is the dharana, which is one of the eight limbs of yoga. The seventh, or dhyana, the seventh limb of yoga, and by the way, these are limbs. This is ashtanga yoga, eight limbs of yoga. They're not actually steps. It's not ashtapada yoga, it's ashtanga yoga. And eight limbs, we know, are all go together. If you pull a table by one leg, all the other legs come along. So all of the limbs of yoga are meant to be practiced together. It's not that one has to perfect uh, uh, pranayama before one can start meditating. Okay. So uh, now, uh, when the fluctuations of consciousness are reduced, that is by collecting the awareness on a single point of focus and then having a repetition of that same single point of focus again and again is what is known as dhyana. Tadevar deshabandha citta siddharana tatra ekatanata dhyanam, having a continued sequence of perception on the same uh, object of attention. Um, and then attending to this object may involve verbal admixture, conceptual understanding, contemplation, it may. But it's without that contemplation that we reach the uh, state of samadhi, without accompanying verbal knowledge and so forth, verbal knowledge and conceptual cognitions. So contemplation is not meditation. 
according to the Yoga Sutras. Dhyana is the continued attention on a single point of focus and Samadhi is the continued attention of the uh, continuation of attention on a single point of focus without any distractions and uh, without any verbal admixture or conceptual admixture. And then one attains the state of uh, asamprajnata samadhi by transcending that single point of focus. It's asamprajnata samadhi or nirbija samadhi which is the ultimate state of yoga, which is the ultimate state meant by uh, by uh, yoga shittavritti niroda, the complete niroda. Now, focused subtle awareness can occur with gross or subtle objects, and when we settle the awareness uh, on samadhi for a, a long time, we've become accustomed to this non cognitive state, and proficiency in this settled focused awareness on a subtle object that establishes pure consciousness or adhyatma prasada in which all fluctuations of consciousness cease and which is interrupted only by residual memory traces. And this is what we call transcendental consciousness in the system of transcendental meditation taught by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. It's a temporary state of pure consciousness interrupted only by stress in the system which then generates activity in the mind. Yes, just one minute. Uh, so focused, subtle awareness on various objects produces many special abilities, which we won't talk about. Uh, these are byproducts of samadhi. Sometimes people translate this sutra as if they are obstacles. They are not obstacles, they're simply byproducts. But they manifest themselves in relative uh, nature. Then when one becomes filled solely with the knowledge of the distinction between the self and nature, one becomes omnipotent and omniscient. Finally, the goal of yoga, the experience of the pure self, cultures dispassion for the activity of the three gunas. Clarity of inner consciousness bears only true knowledge. This is Ritambhara Pragna. And finally, uh, this concerns the true nature of the individual situation one is involved in, not with conceptual knowledge or verbal knowledge about the uh, situation. So these memory traces of this correct knowledge displace the incorrect knowledge. And finally, at the pinnacle of knowledge, the distinction between the self and nature uh, becomes constant. And uh, this also then has to be transcended. And when this is quieted, the seed of all faults is destroyed, completely silent awareness, free of any seeds of interruption that is near Dija Samadhi is achieved in the state of absolute isolation of the self. So, Tasyapi Nirodhe Sarva Nirodha near Bija Samadhi. And in the ultimate, uh, the last sutra of the Yoga Sutras, uh, we have uh, the uh, sum, summation Purusharta Shunyanam gunanam pratiprasava kaivalyam. There's the pratisprasava of nature, that is manifest nature, recedes into its silent state and the self is left by itself with pure consciousness. And purusharta shunyanam gunanam pratiprasava kaivalyam swarupa pratishtava chiti shakti. The chiti shakti, the power of consciousness, uh, stands in its own nature and that is the ultimate state of yoga. The uh, consciousness is completely pure and has the ability to perceive nature as it is in its silent unmanifest state rather than in the smoke screen of activity uh, which is generated uh, by, uh, by the confusion of the action of the three gunas. Thank you. Okay. So its surface is active and then the mind must be active in that same level with the vrittis. So then there's an opportunity for less active, less active, more silent, and then ultimately silence. You could say that pure consciousness, tadiya chetna, whatever. That is the path, and this is the state of yoga. So from here, we understand that we need to find in everybody's purusha, every individual brain, because we're doing this for the planet. We're not doing it for us, we're doing it for the planet. Every Purusha, every individual has a quality and a characteristic that follows this. 
This is universal. So we're going to transcend. To do that, we have a mind, like the ocean, coming out of the self, Atma. And thoughts bubble up all day. Right now, you're looking at my hand, watching the screen, thoughts are bubbling up. They don't come from staples, they come from inside you. Okay? So, they keep coming up. If you were to trace back, all right, there on Dhyan, if you trace back in an effortless way, it is possible for the mind to settle back on a given thought. Very easily. Very spontaneously create and experience a fourth state of consciousness. Not waking, not dreaming, not sleeping. Tariya Chaitna. Okay? This is that samadhi. This is that yoga that was defined in the Yoga Sutras. The complete settling in the mind. This is the transcending process, and this is basically what is utilized in the technique of transcendental meditation. Some of you have heard about it or know about it. So transcending to samadhi, it's a very simple thing. It's easy. It's been shown all over the world for the last half a century. Anybody can do it. Anybody can transcend to samadhi. And it's not hard, it's effortless. In fact, if you use effort, it's nearly impossible. It's also natural, it's part of the system, that's why everybody can do it. No concentrated needing, and there's no control. You can't get simpler than this. It's just the settling of the mind. It's not the control, it's not a manipulation. So in TM, all we have is the, whoop, what happened there? We have a mantra, and we go in. And what happens is that when the mind goes in, the brain has to cooperate. There's a relationship. So the brain also gets a chance to settle down. And when it settles down, it has that direct experience of the underlying field, atma, okay? Unified field in physics. This is aligning your brain with order. It's taking to the field of all unification of all natural law. So this is living yoga. So to do that, let's talk about how the brain can do that. How can the brain accomplish this settling process? How is it possible that anybody, as long as they can think a thought, which is most people, they can do this? It's a natural component to the brain. And here is your brain. This is from 100 years ago. You never knew your brain had all these colors and little dots and dashes, but you used to draw that when you were a kid, right? So it's there, there. But there's diversity, OK? And that means this diversity represents a huge range of intelligence. Every one of these cells, and there's 20 billion here and 100 billion in the brain, every one of these cells has a different job. One job is to know your mother. One job is to know Modi, okay? So there's levels of unification. Another is to bring connectivity. We start with a genomic network. The genes are organized to create a metabolic network, the cells and all the activity, which in turn creates a whole structure, your brain. And there's all these fiber networks in your brain. You may not want to know it, but your brain is primarily spaghetti. All right? It's just noodles with a couple computers stuck on top. Okay. So here's your brain. And if you haven't seen it before, it's very beautiful. Here's your prefrontal cortex, the very front. Not good to hit with soccer balls. Here's the side here. This is where you create your objects, temporal lobes and so forth. The back vision. Here's your motor, here's your, your skin, and this is where you create your world. So you could have thousands of areas of your brain, or you could have two. You can have the front, you, and the back, the world. It's really that simple. The front is you, the back is the world, and you have wires that connect you and the world. You have wires that connect billions of cells to create the thought you're having right now. That thought gets created. It's not on some chip somewhere. You're creating it out of the self. And here are those wires. Just a few of them, because there's too many to show here. Here are a diagram of wires. Here's the front of your brain, the side. Here's coming in and out from the body and so forth, temporal lobes. These wires are the connecting points between all the diversity of your brain. There's probably quantum mechanical reason too, but let's stay with the simple spaghetti, OK? The wires work. We understand the wires. And here are the wires, based on all the cortical regions. And here are the primary, the key focal points. All right. There's 180,000, that's 180,000 kilometers of wires in your brain, in your cortex. All right. That's like five and a half times around the Earth. That makes your thoughts. 
That creates all the connection there, the unification. So we're going to unify through networks. There's other reasons, but networks work because it's been found that these cortical association fibers are related to this principle of unity. And in modern science, it's called communication through coherence. That means if you have a group of people together, the communication depends upon the people paying attention to each other. Right? If the speaker is not paying attention to you and you're not paying attention to the speaker, there's no communication. That means you have to be in sync. You have to be correlated. You have to be attending. Coherence. We're going to see that coherence relates to samadhi, relates to yoga. Union, coherence, correlation. It's all the same. So, you might know Dr. Tony Nader, MD, PhD, wrote a book a while back where he correlated the Yoga Sutras with the intelligence of the cortical association fibers. All those wires we were looking at, those aren't just spaghetti, those are the intelligence of the Yoga Sutras. Yoga Sutras have a meaning of the, of the sutra, okay, but they also have the sound meaning of the sutra, the intelligence embedded in there. If you take the four chapters, samadhi and so forth, these four chapters correlate to different parts of the brain. So you can have a thousand parts of the brain or four parts of the brain, however you want to di dissect it and organize it. But each one of these padas have to do with a specific territory of the human brain. And in particular, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. For every sutra, there's a cortical area, which means this sutra, the 31st, in this chapter, chapter four, it means the intelligence of this part of your brain is connected by all those fibers connected to the rest of the brain. So this part of the brain is connected to the whole rest of the brain. This part of the brain is connected to the whole rest of the brain. This is connecting diversity with unity, connecting the part to the whole, bringing everybody together at each moment so you have the best possible thinking. A one-to-one -one correspondence, and that's unification through the neural networks. So in the brain, we can look at the EEG, which is a measure of connectivity, how things are working together. And if we use it, this is down in uh, Tirupati, we're doing some research there, you can document the samadhi. These students, they start meditating, within a, a, an hour or less, they're already in samadhi. And then over time, you can see the brain waves. We'll show you that in a moment. So for example, here's two brain waves in the front of the brain and the back of the brain. Very dynamic, very diverse. If you start with TM, something happens. The diversity, the complexity, within a, a second or less becomes simple. You go into a very simple, unified state represented by these brain waves, which we don't have to go into any great detail, but we're going to show you that if you look at all the brain, and this is some of the work we, Fred and I have done, you can see the whole brain gets coordinated very quickly. And we're going to show this in a moment in the live thing. Here's EEG, and here is the coherence. This is your level of correlation from minimum to maximum. All right, a little bit, a lot. And you see how it goes up and down? That's how life goes. You get something, you get rid of it. You get something, you get rid of it. You get your car keys, you forget about them, now you're in your car. You forget about your dog. You, you have to come and go, okay? Things come and go, and then you start meditating, and all you do is just come. You just move into that samadhi state, and it becomes sustained high levels of coherence. This is just the front of the brain. If you want to look at the rest of the brain, person starts meditating here, and you can see the whole thing becomes almost instantaneously settled, high levels of coherence that are sustained. And of course, there's fluctuations in almost everybody's meditation. If you were to clap your hands or hear a car go by or a dog bark, then there's going to be a little tension go out, and then you go right back into the self. So samadhi is very flexible. In fact, these excursions probably relate to different things. We can also relate that there's other frequencies besides just alpha, which we were looking at. You have faster frequencies and even faster frequencies, which correspond to different aspects of experience. And what we find in meditation, here's a baseline. If you look at a couple years later, see the difference? The brain becomes completely coherent across all the dynamic rhythms of the brain. Okay? So, and for that, a half a century of research shows that when that happens, when somebody just very effortlessly settles into samadhi, the body and the brain gets very orderly, very healthy, very dynamic. And as a result, to summarize without showing you a lot of research slides, if you have that coherence, that samadhi, you're going to be more creative. 
You're going to be more moral. You're going to have more inner orientation, enlightenment, less anxiety. You're going to learn better, more aware. You're going to run and jump, compute, intelligence, and so forth. This is just a little bit of the half a century of research showing that samadhi, as been brought out by the speakers, is a way to improve the quality of everybody's brain and mind very simply and very quickly. So with that, let me summarize that when you transcend, when you let the mind settle down through this effortless technique, samadhi is there. When the samadhi is there, the brain is in this very powerful state of orliness, more orly than any other state found in medical science. It's better in waking, dreaming, sleeping. It's that fourth state, thiriya chetna. When you have that, the brain potential is now released. All right. And you're going to hear later on from some of the doctors that when they do transcend, so many problems can eradicate it very easily. And then finally, how about just being healthy, happy, successful, and the growth to Kavalya? This is what's going to happen in the next presentation, but right now I'm going to invite Dr. Karen Oyoki to come up, and I'm going to show you quickly what her brain waves look like. Here's a screen showing two leads of the EEG in the, in the front, front of the brain. And then below that is the coherence. Remember, it's from minimum to maximum, all right? So this is brain coherence. It goes up and down because she's listening to me and she's watching you and so forth like that. So if we ask her to start meditating. Um, you notice what happened? As soon as I asked her to meditate, you could see the change. That each part of the brain, and here we're looking at two, you could look at 200, but each part of the brain became more orderly individually. And then this one shows how this side and this side became more orderly. You can almost see how similar these traces look. This is just a very accurate demonstration of what you see up here. That quickly, she settled down. That's uh, 10 or 15. 15, OK. Settled down and then continued on in a very high level of coherence. This is the simple practice of transcending, transcendental meditation, which allows an individual to experience that inner value. Aging process. Yes, the aging process. Aging process. Yes. Can they be reversed? Yes. This is the opposite of the aging process. Right. Aging is a progressive disconnection. Yes. Right. It's a progressive loss of yoga. Right. That's all aging is. Mm -hmm. It's non-yoga. Okay? Right, right. And it's, it's been shown for the last 40, 50 years that the wires in your brain, they right. don't do so well. The cells don't do so well. Right. So what happens, you disconnect the system. Right. It's not the junk in the brain. We don't like junk in the brain, but you can live to 90 years old and have all the junk you want in the brain and still play cards and know your friends. So the junk is not good. But what we want is coherence and orliness of brain functioning. Right. That's how people who have more education and more exercise and stuff like that, even if they have plaque and other things in the brain, they have enough connection to be able to compensate for that growing sort of garbage in the brain which you don't want it. So yes, to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia, and it's been shown now at UCLA that TM is probably the single most effective tool to preventing or even reversing in some cases Alzheimer's. So it's a very powerful system. I mean, India has Alzheimer's and diabetes, cardiovascular, it's got a lot of things, and it has a tradition. All you do is put them together, right? Yoga and the source of yoga. If you have pain, they did a research study about 15 years ago that shows that there's two parts of pain, and they can be dissociated. There's the, the damage here, and the brain knows about it, yeah, no and correct. there's a actual pain, right. but then there's okay. this subjective tendency of, of suffering from the pain. Okay. Oh my God, the pain's gone. This is what happens a lot with back pain. The back yes. gets healed, but they still have that emotional vritti goes on, and they keep thinking, oh, my back is pain, my back is back pain. What they've shown is with transcendental meditation is that the reality of the pain is still interpreted correctly by the brain. Fine. It still knows that you've got your hand in a pot of hot water, OK? okay. It's just not nice, right? not boiling hot. Okay? But the brain doesn't light up. It's not like, oh my god, my hand is in a pot of hot water. It's just called, my hand's so, in a pot of hot water. Brain, what effects on the brain when uh, one Like say asanas? Yeah. Is there effect of asanas on the brain? On the of the meditation. 
Why? We know asanas can affect the brain. When okay. people do asanas, they did this almost 20 years ago in Denmark. They showed that the brain gets into a more relaxed state. How many, how many billions of people in the world are there? It's that simple. The major discussion point came out with Dr. Roshi presenting the understanding of yoga is control of the mind. Ashtanga yoga is steps of doing. And Ashtanga yoga are not steps, but limbs. And so we see yoga is doing or yoga is being. We're going to be talking about yoga as being, specifically in terms of higher states of consciousness. Yoga in the Upanishad, thou art the fourth. It's called the fourth. And we can see this in this two by two diagram that yoga is different from waking, sleeping, and dreaming. We have self awareness, yes and no, thoughts, yes and no. Sleeping, sleeping is no sense of self, no content. What about this one here, sense of self and content? What state of consciousness is that? Waking, yes, thank you. There's content, me, PowerPoint, but there's self awareness. There's awareness of where you're sitting in the room. There's awareness of the thoughts in your mind, the feelings going on. I like to argue here, where there's thoughts but no sense of self is dreaming. There may be a sense of self in dreaming, but it's very fragile. It leaves this cell here where there's self-awareness but no thoughts. Now, if you're a psychologist, you would say, Dr. Travis, it's just an artifact. You made this two-by-two two table. It has a square, but it doesn't exist. I mean, after all, how can you be aware of yourself if you're not aware that you're the experiencer, if you're not aware of this inner outer dichotomy? Now, this objection is coming from waking state where thoughts and self are together. This is the state of yoga, Turiya Chaitana, or pure consciousness. The fundamental point is notice it's different than waking, sleeping, and dreaming. The subject-object relationship is fundamentally different. It's a fourth state of consciousness. At Maharshi University of Management, all the students practice transcendental meditation, which leads to the state of yoga, pure consciousness, for many moments in each meditation. So I ask them, tell me, describe your deepest experiences. Forty-seven students did this. Then I did something called content analysis. We you take a whole sentence, you collapse it down to one or two words. You do this for everyone, you see what are the words most often used. This is what they, the words they use to describe the state of yoga. It's the absence of time. It's the absence of space. It's the absence of body sense. It's self-awareness outside of time, outside of space. These three, time, space, and body sense, is what makes meaning of waking. Right now, the meaning we're having is because we're here in the Grand Hall at the consulate. It's late morning, moving on to lunch. Notice that the state of yoga isn't distorted waking, but rather the foundation of meaning in waking is gone. It's absent. What's happening in the brain? I'd like to give us another angle on this. Brain's looking to the right. Neural, this is uh, the center of the brain. It's called the thalamus. But what it is, it's the switchboard. Neuroscientists found there's two types of uh, cells here. One are called core nuclei. And the core nuclei bring in vision, hearing, touch. And then the thalamus, what it does is it makes connections with the surface, and you get this loop. This neural loop is a neural representation of what's outside. That's how you actually take information in. But what's important for yoga is they also document a second type of cell. They're called matrix nuclei. They're spread throughout the thalamus. The input to the matrix nuclei is wakefulness circuits coming up the spinal cord. These also create loops with the cortex, but what these loops maintain is wakefulness. Typically, they go together. Right now, you're awake. There's a PowerPoint, so you can repeat what's gone on. By transcending, what is the process of decreasing content but maintaining wakefulness? This is a physiology that maintains the state of yoga. 
as a state of being. It's the complete settling of the activity of the mind. The content of the mind has settled. Silence remains. It's the silence which is underlying all of experience. Now it takes a tenth of a second for this loop to go up and down. And so what these loops would do would give rise to a 10 cycle per second wave. And that's what we see, that's what we saw with Karen. Also notice that it's coming from the central point. So whatever is the activity, it's going to be coherent. We saw this from four points in Karen. This is coherence from 32 points. Uh, each column is a frequency band. A dot is where you record brain waves. If there's a light line between the dots, it means the coherence is 70%. If there's a very sharp line like here, it's 90% or higher. We see coherence in this 10 cycle per second wave. We see it primarily in the front of the brain, but systematically left and right, front and back. This is the orderly state of the brain that's supporting that state of union of yoga. One other thing is happening is important is there's increased blood flow to the front of the brain. Dr. Ellerick called that the CEO. That organizes the rest of the brain. There's decreased blood flow in the brainstem. The state of yoga is one of silence. Mind, body are silent, but it's one of heightened alertness. So that's one state of consciousness, a fourth state of consciousness. By Moving the brain to the state of yoga during meditation, back to activity, yoga, meditation, you bring them together, and this is growth of enlightenment. So let's look at enlightenment in terms of this two by two grid. To understand it, we have to take this from a, a two dimensional, make it into a cube, and then we have to sort of turn it on its corner, so it sort of look like this. So what we have is now that state of yoga, pure consciousness, is an all-time reality. The state of being is lived 24-7, and it underlies the other states of consciousness. It's self-awareness during sleep. It's not a stream of thoughts, hearing the sounds outside, hearing your spouse snore, but there's a continuum. That is a sense of self which is there when you go to sleep. It's there throughout the night. It's not like they go away and come back. This person teaches at our K through 12 school in Fairfield, Iowa. Notice this concrete analogy they use. It's like the fizzing on top of a soda when you poured it. That's during waking state. Now the state of consciousness goes out through the senses, through the intellect, and engages with the world as something to identify with. When I'm sleeping, it's like the fizzing goes down. By analogy, the soda is there. The soda which is there during sleeping is underlying waking and dreaming. What do the brain waves look like in this situation? These are brain waves during sleep. This is a second. Here we see the brain waves going up once a second. It's called delta EEG. This is when you're getting the restoration of sleep. Notice in this when the person has a state of yoga integrated with a state of sleep. We still see this very large, slow waves. The delta activity is the same, but it looks a little more jagged. Notice here, there's a fast activity going on at the same time. Let's count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Do you see that? There's a 10 cycle per second wave, which underlies the experience of yoga a one cycle per second wave that underlies sleep. You've integrated these two states of consciousness. Let's look at during waking. There's something added to activity. It's not something you see, it's not something you hear. It's just being, there's something underlying. And that's the full inner being, self-awareness is there as you go through life. And what the brain wave looks like here, I think you'd be able to guess. Here we have two rows of brain waves. These are when the eyes are open, you're processing. One of these has been practicing TM for six months. One of them has been practicing TM for 24 years and reports that integration of yoga with waking. Which do you think is a 24-year meditator? 
How many think the top? How many think the bottom? Yeah, it's the bottom. Notice what's happening. The brain waves that we saw previously, when their eyes are closed, they're transcending, the senses are turned within, are there when the eyes are open. This is bringing yoga into daily life. This is yoga sta, kuru karmani. We call this brain integration. And here we have brain integration in non-meditating, short-term, long-term TM practitioners. So this was interesting research, but we wondered what's the practical significance of this? You talked about leaders. What's the practical significance? We thought, look at leaders. Leaders are able to function under stress. They're able to maintain the big picture. So we looked at leaders. World-class athletes participate in Olympics and World Games. They have that signature of the integration of yoga with activity more than the control athletes. Top-level managers, the same thing. And we asked the managers, how come you're so successful? Nobody said, I worked harder or I'm smarter. <laughs> what they all said is they could rely on their inner intuition. That's the practical significance of the state of yoga. That deep inner silence is the essential nature of who you are and is how you connect with the rest of nature. We looked at classical musicians. Both have high levels of brain integration. That's because if you play music as a child, your brain is connected differently as an adult. Music cultures the brain. Here we have short-term and long-term TM practice. I have this here not to suggest that transcending is going to make you a great musician, manager, or athlete. But the point that's bringing out is transcending. Contacting the state of yoga, morning and afternoon. Bringing that into activity is going to give you the edge. It's going to give you the edge to be a great leader because you're culturing the brain to support clearer thinking, more broad performance. We are wired for enlightenment. And we have an incredible opportunity that the objective tools of modern science can validate the subjective intuition from Vedic science. And I welcome any of you who have access to individuals reporting the experience of enlightenment, contact me because the measures we find should be universal for all individuals. Thank you. So in other words, the training uh, does not add to the, to the scores or? I think what we're seeing here is um, this is primarily driven by the culturing effect of music. By itself. And amateur and professional doesn't distinguish how well you play music. It Beautiful. distinguishes how you make your money. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's why we're seeing that. Music as it is has no language to begin with, so it's a totally yeah, different. Yeah, that's very good. Very yeah. good. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Thank you. Contributed to uh, your research. And where are we when compared to when this was probably uh, taken under its uh, current one? Excellent. So the value of modern science is to understand and make more easy the ability to probe what's happening in the brain. And I don't want to collapse the brilliance of yoga to chemical functioning in the brain, but the brain is the interface. We're seeing the world through the brain. We're seeing our inner experience through the brain. So by looking at the brain, you get an idea of what's happening in consciousness. And that's its, its greatest value, what we saw with Dr. Arenander. Um, very simple machine which can be moved around so we can begin to probe what are the brain changes that happen as people begin to transcend, as the transcendent comes into activity. So it's uh, more all, each advance in medical science is an advance to understand the depth of Vedic science. We have had uh, five Please. very good presentations from textual studies to practice, practical study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the end we went to the scientific practical study. And uh, we are very glad to have such efficient, uh, that's a very efficient uh, people among us doing with the uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra of ancient times. 
and uh, they have brought the idea to the modern times that is the thing and you can have further research and um, I think there will be a time when uh, yoga will um, transcend even uh, medical science. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The session is over. Thank you.